What is going on, everybody? Welcome to another podcast of Prospects Overload, presented by Prospects Worldwide. As always, I'm your lovely and talented host, Drake Mann. You can follow me on Twitter, at DrakeMan4. And I'm joined by my co-host, Austin Farmer. Uh, Austin, introduce yourself. What's up, everybody? Uh, like Drake said, I'm Austin. You can follow me on Twitter at AustinF0421. And uh, today we're joined by a pretty good guest. Uh, Brian, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. Um, uh, my name is Brian Recca. I write and scout for prospectslive.com. And uh, you can find me on Twitter. It's where a lot of my content is these days. Uh, at Brian underscore Recca, R-E-C-C-A. And uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. I mean, Austin, I was going to make that much more like, you know, dramatic on who we, we were having today. Like, you know, saying this guy's like one of the best draft guys on Twitter to follow and, you know, and just just hype him up a lot. But you, you, you kind of took my job. So thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah. Any any time, man. Yeah. All right. All right. So, boys, we have a kind of a loaded pro- podcast today. We're going to be talking about some old faces new faces we're bringing back overrated underrated you know the part that where everybody gets really mad at us but you know we're gonna start off today with one segment called busted prospects and this is is how close this prospect is until they are labeled as a bust and today we start off with miguel amaya of the cubs so who wants to start us off Sure. So, so the idea is to to say if I think he's a bust or not, basically. Basically, how close is he to being in that bust category? Like, like you could just say, like, you know, he's twenty three right now. But I mean, to me, Miguel Amaya is twenty three, but he should already be holding down the catcher position for the Cubs, but he's not. So, to me, he's starting to get to that bust level gotcha. for how much hype he had, pretty much. Well, I'll. I think that's fair that he did have a lot of hype, and the you know, the shine on his prospect status has certainly dulled a bit. Um, but as you said, he's still only twenty three. I think I think something that happens a lot with Latin American prospects, international guys, is they're around for so long because we hear about them getting signed when they're sixteen, seventeen, and then they're in the minors for seemingly forever, and. You know, someone like Miguel Amaya has been around for a long time, but at the, but you know, on the other side of that, he's still only 23. He could be bad next year, turn things around, and still be younger than Joey Bart. Like the, like you know, if you put it in that context, I think it's you know, especially with catchers. Catchers just man, they go from like being awful to being great. Like the, like I think a lot of it, like the rigors of the position, plays a huge role. Um, learning the position is is obviously different than any anywhere else on the diamond. So I, I'm very slow to label a uh, you know a Latin catching prospect a bust at 23 years old. We saw someone like Francisco Mejia kind of turn things around where he's now he's at least a piece in the major leagues. You know maybe Miguel Amaya is not a star catcher, but I mean with his defense and you know the fact that he's you know hasn't been awful. When he's played, you know, obviously he's dealt with injuries, but you know, it just seems like he will be some type of major league piece, but maybe you know, not the second, you know, the heir apparent to Contreras that we all thought he was going to be. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, I I do like what that you brought up about how I feel like expectations for Latin players they they are always like we we actually covered this in a podcast one time where where all these fans see is video and all they hear is the numbers on these guys. And like, and then they come to stateside and they're not, you know, maybe not there. They're not at the expectation as what fans or even some evaluators thoughts are like, Oh, well, they're already a bus. So it's like, it's very interesting to hear that from another point of view. And, you know, a lot of fans do also see like, like Brian was saying, a lot of these guys sign at 16, 17. So they're like, Oh my God, you know, he's really young. You know, he's, he might be more advanced, et cetera. And, I, you know, that's not always true. And I, I I do agree with Brian more about him not being a bust just yet. I would say he's got at least another season or two before he hits that, but he's definitely not what people were expecting. So that that's my take on that. I'm going to keep mine short and simple. 
All right. Yeah. That's, that's good points all around. I mean, but yeah, I think Miguel Amaya is a really interesting case, especially because if you think, I know rankings aren't the best to go off of, but he, he is going to continue to probably drop until he's with the Cubs and actually making a name for himself in Chicago. So are we, are we good? Did anyone have any more points? No. I think that's pretty good for me. Um, I just, I, you know, I think also with a guy like Amaya, like he, if he can defend, at, you know, an MLB level or even, you know, a be- above average level, he's going to be in the majors for a pretty good long, you know, a good amount of time because there just aren't that many good catchers in baseball. And if you can even hit just a little bit, you can have a long career. So um, I still, I still think there's hope for Amaya. Hopefully he gets the, like the injury stuff, you know, figured out he could stay healthy, but uh, I, I think it's too soon to completely write him off. I love what you just said because a lot of people like love the Adley Rutschmans that can literally hit and field and do all that, but they don't like the the guys like that's why Jeff Mathis had such an amazing career yeah. <laughs> because yeah. all he did was just good defense. That's why. People say Austin Hedges is one of the best catchers in baseball because of his defense. It's like I know, I it's it's so that. interesting how yeah. people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Austin says that all the time. But yeah, that's that's really interesting that you said about his defense. So may, maybe maybe I'm wrong a little bit with the the whole entire bus situation, but it'll be interesting to to see what happens with him going forward and what the Cubs are going to do with him. But we're going to move forward here. Normally, Austin, you know how we only have one start bench cut. Oh, the Lord. We got two today, and they're both 2022 editions. Oh, okay. Oh, man. <laughs> are you are you too ready? I hope I'm you ready. all heard my sigh just now of desperation because Drake <laughs> makes me <these> hard. <laughs> all right, so we have right-handed pitchers and left-handed pitchers. For right-handed pitchers, start bench cut. Obviously, for the people, if you guys don't know what start bench cut is, you're – Starting one, bench one, cut one if you were a coach and you had the three choices. Right-handed pitcher, we got we'll, – we'll talk about first. Kumar Rocker, Brock Porter, and Dylan Lesko. Austin, I'm going to go straight to you because I know I, – I, I just like torturing you. Yeah, you know, you got two Rangers in here and one guy who, who could potentially be a, a phenomenal pitcher. So, you know, you're making me eat my heart out, and I hate you for this. So that's uh, shot number two for that. Um, I'm going to go with start Kumar because that's obvious. And then this is uh, this kills me, but I am going to go with a bias pick and I'm going to uh, bench Brock Porter and then I'm going to cut Lesko. And that kills me to do that because I love Lesko too. And I do think that he has more upside than uh, Porter, but due to his injury and also the, my bias right now, I'm going to roll with that. Of course, Austin. Anytime, buddy. I got you. But, uh, Brian, what's yours here? This is tough. I mean, these are all first-round pitchers, in my view. They have first-round talents. I think, for me, I'm going to have to go start Let's go. Even with the Tommy John surgery, he was just so good for so long. And there just aren't a lot of holes in his game. I honestly thought he would still go in the top ten. Even with the Tommy John, obviously he dropped down a little bit, but I'm still a huge fan. I'm going to bench Rocker. Um, I'm a big Rocker fan. I have been for a while. It was really awesome to see him kind of turn things around and get rewarded for it um, this coming draft, this last draft. Um, and I guess I'm going to cut Brock Porter, which is tough because he's he's kind of a freak. But uh, yeah, for me, I, I still have questions about his his breaking ball. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a very good group, and yeah, that was tough. Brock Porter's my cut, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Welcome to our prospects of We make stuff <laughs> tough. <laughs> good. So, all right. So for me, I I gotta b- agree with you, Brian. I'm I'm starting. Let's go. I mean, I well, am I crazy for saying this? I remember people were saying he's one of the best like pitching prospects in this draft in a long time. It, like he had the stuff, yeah. he had the change up curveball, he had all that. If it wasn't for his Tommy John, he would have won top five, most likely. Probably, yeah, I, yeah, I would say so. At least ten. I would, I... Yeah. So, so the Padres kind of stole him out of this draft, but 
you know, that's just that's just the Padres and AJ Preller being smart. Yeah. Um, I would probably bench Rocker, even though I'm I'm worried about him somewhat because Rocker has. I remember where I did a report on him one time, and I did notice that like through his outings, his velo would decrease, and that really like worried me. So that rocker, even though I love him, his stuff is amazing. I'm worried about him being a starter long term. But I think <laughs> being reunited with Jack Leiter will really help him going forward. And I'm just gonna cut Brock Porter. Um, even though, you know, he's a stud pitcher and the Rangers got two of these three arms, like that's I I, I think I just think you gotta keep him Porter. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> sure. Yeah, Brian, he's a Austin is a Rangers fan, so yeah, yeah, he, same he's gone through, <laughs> yeah, he's gone through some yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, 2011 Austin. I hate you so much, Drake. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. After the past few seasons of just no horrid pitching, now that the Rangers finally have pitching depth, or at least some pitching depth in their system, it really, I mean, you know, they have a pretty they have, they have a good amount of infield depth and everything, you know, decent bats, but pitching has always just been the main issue with the Rangers um, the last few seasons. So seeing them finally build onto that, it, it, it's so refreshing. Thank you. Yeah, I think also just to piggyback off of that, it's cool. I think it's great. They have so they have a bunch of guys with like pretty good upside and they don't need to rely on like, any one dude to be amazing and Brock Porter isn't like a you know I'm like a stud pitcher you know they still have you know Kumar Rocker they still have Owen White they still have all these other guys so they really are doing a really good job of building up the depth as well as like potential impact pitchers which is pretty cool to see and for anyone yeah, that's that very know, interesting for anyone that doesn't know go check out who Mitch Brad is because that guy has an amazing curveball yeah oh Mitch Brad yes sir one of my favorites I saw out here in uh, Arizona Complex League last year. All right, so now we go to the left-handed pitcher portion, and this is with, or this is um, Cooper Jerpy, Robbie Snelling, and Connor Prelip. Brian, I'll let you take the the first one here, the first uh, start bench cut. Sure. So the start was really easy for me. Um, I love Cooper Jerpy. I think he's going to move really fast. I think he's also just like not a whole lot of flaws to his game. A lot of the criticism is like the way, you know, his mechanics work and things like that, but it also gives him a huge edge on the mound. So um, I'll take Cooper Jerpy as a start. And this was tough. The bench and cut was pretty close. I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm very uh, close to saying Snelling to bench, but I'm going to take Connor Prelip just because I think there there's going to be a lot of development for him in the pros, and we just haven't seen him uh, in a long time. There's just so much to build on. Um, Stelling, I will have to cut, even though I like him. I liked him pretty early last year, and then he kind of blew up and became, you know, a top 40 pick or whatever it was. And uh, But unfortunately, I will have to cut him, even though I think he's, uh, he's a really interesting pitcher to build on. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, so, uh, Austin, let's hear yours. Well, it's going to be the same as yours, Brian. I am going to start Jerpy. I think his slider is insane. I think that there's a lot of potential with that pitch. I think it could even develop into a 70 pitch possibly. I'm going to bench Prelip. I know I almost cut him for the fact that he was injured, but prior to the injury, I saw a lot of projection with his arm, and I do think that once he comes back healthy – that yeah they'll develop them they'll develop them nicely along the way and i think that he could he should advance fairly quickly once he does come back and i really haven't seen a whole lot of snelling so that is also a big reason why i've cut him it's more that i've had eyes on prelip and i like what i saw prelip before the injury so i yeah pretty much the same answer i'll refrain from nerding out so you know this doesn't end up a two-hour long episode Well, maybe it will. Who knows? With our overrated, underrated. But I, I again, I yeah, you, you pretty much have to start Jerpy. And you know, Randy Flores of the Cardinals. Thank you very much for Jerpy and for constantly in and out having some of the best drafts. Even though 
and there's a lot of risk with some of the stuff he does, but I would, I'd bench prelip and, and also uh, cut Snelling as well. Just, yeah, as Brian said, that was a really hard one. And I, and I can't believe I just made a really hard one for myself too. So that was, that's really interesting on, on all parts. Yeah, that was a good one. I, Robbie Snelling, he was somebody who didn't really fully concentrate on baseball. He was a two sport guy. And he really had like impressive physicality during like the showcases, but then he started focusing on baseball more. And then that's when like, he just, it just kind of blew up. So he's like, like a trending up arrow guy. So it could be another huge steal in the draft for, uh, who, who took him? Was it the, uh, the Padres? The Padres? Yeah. It could be another <laughs> huge steal. Like that's a dangerous combo him and Wesco. Yeah. Cause I, I think, I think that they oversawed him too. I think that they, yeah. Oh yeah. Him. Or did they, did they overslot Lesko too? I forgot. I think that they. I don't think Lesko slot. did. I think yeah, Lesko I got like, they... yeah, I think he got like four point five million, and the slot was somewhere around there. But, but Snelling, I believe they did go over slot. Yeah, he was yeah. an LSU, LSU recruit, so. Didn't uh, was oh, yeah, he... LSU. That's that insane. Yeah. What? Uh, wasn't uh Tuki Tucson also like a. a two sport guy like he's like he grew up playing soccer and he didn't discover baseball until like high school or something i i think as well and uh you know he kind of had a cup rough couple of years but now he's a pretty solid pitcher for uh braves i think or no no not braves um what the... hold on i should be prepared for this no you're right that he was with the braves i think he got designated though i, I think uh, he's He's with somebody else. I saw him pitching uh like a week or so ago. Uh, Angels. Angels. Oh Angels yeah. 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 But yeah. Uh yeah. yeah no, I, I really liked him. Tuki Tucson. But yeah. It seems like he's more of a reliever. Yeah. And I mean he the the outing that I saw him with the Angels, he was really good. But yeah, I just thought that was interesting that you mentioned that he Snelling didn't start really focusing on baseball until high school so that i for whatever reason that popped up in my uh, he he did play he, he i should say he did play but he also played football i think he was like a four-star recruit in football oh wow where like he could have actually played college ball so i think you know he focused more on baseball and then you know it just became pretty apparent that he was a better baseball player than you know people realized so now is a part of the show <laughs> where we make a lot of people angry with overrated underrated um i'm gonna go last because i actually have multiple of each but uh brian because you're new here i'll let i'll let you take uh underrated first so who's your underrated prospect oh wow i had a few lined up so i'm gonna i'm gonna limit myself to to just one and i'm gonna go i don't think people realize how good zach netto is yet <laughs> So that's going to be my underrated. I think Zach Neto is going to be a very, very good shortstop in the major leagues for a long time, along the lines of like a Dansby Swanson type player. Uh, and I don't think people fully get that yet. And a lot of people were like, why is this guy in double A? What are the Angels doing? And it's like, oh, if there was any player from this class that could do it, it would be him. His, he, like, I know the swing looks, you know, freaky as all hell. I get it. But the results are the results. He hits the ball hard. He doesn't chase. He makes contact. Like the, he checks all the boxes, and he's a really good defensive shortstop who should stick there. So that would be my underrated guy. All right. So uh, Austin, um, man, it would have been funny if we had Kane Schmidt in here because as soon as the Angels drafted uh, Nate Nito, um, oh, he yeah. went in the message and said, "I hate." I hate the Angels. <laughs> he wanted jerpies. He so wanted bad. he wanted Cooper jerpies so bad. Yeah, it's so funny. So it, it was just hilarious that you said <laughs> Nito as your your underrated prospect. Hey, I I mean he's I and mean, it's a really small sample, but like he's already off to a pretty damn good start. So it's like realistically could be in the majors within end of next year or something. Like not crazy. So we'll see. Yeah, I'm surprised very, he yeah. last. I'm surprised he lasted the 13th pick. To be honest, I thought he would go. I thought he was. He was someone who was getting a lot of hype as things as the draft got closer. And I thought he was going to go inside the top 10, maybe even like to the Cubs or the Marlins at uh, six or seven. But Angels got a deal. 
Yeah, this draft is really weird, to be honest. Like, like as soon as Jackson Holiday went one, it just felt it just seemed like, oh my god. And then Rocker going as high yeah, as did. Like, this was just weird. Yeah, that's yeah, what did, number I think. Three. When I saw that the Rangers chose yeah. Rocker, I was like, what in the heck? Like, I mean, I like Rocker, but I I thought that the Rangers were going to go after someone like uh, Elijah Green. And so that just threw me off completely. Yeah. Yeah, same. Absolutely. So anyway, Austin, uh, who's your underrated? Uh, So I think I'm actually going to have two this round as well. My first one is going to be Yiddy Cap. He's a Marlins outfielder. I really like his hit tool. I I wouldn't say it's above average from what I've seen. I, I like the power projection that's there. He's not going to hit a ton of home runs, but he should sneak in like 20 plus with a lot of doubles, I feel. And I think my next guy is going to be Cade Doty. I've been all over the Doty train ever since I saw him at Shriners and he, he hits like he fell to the second round. And I, I was... But yeah, I've been I've been on the Doty train ever since Shriners, and I I was really convinced that he would go at least the second half of the first round to like the compensation around in the sandwich pick in between the first and second, and for him to fall all the way to the second round to the Blue Jays, I thought that was a little bit crazy. That and I now the Jays have a really solid bat. Like he was the best clutch hitter that I saw in college baseball this year, and he should provide a lot of runs. He you know, good situational hitter, and just I, I think he's got a plus bat. And you know, he had, he did move from third to second with Jacob Berry coming in, and I do like him better at second. But he he is also versatile on the field, so that, those are going to be my two underrated. Yeah, that's very interesting, Brian. You said you had a couple. Did you want to say another? Because since we both have two, yeah. I mean, if you yeah, want to sure. Do- I'll All throw right, another one. Ahead. I'm going to throw in a guy uh, he was drafted last year. Um, his name's Nico Cavadas, uh, first baseman for the Red Sox. Um, he went to Notre Dame, huge power guy. Um, not the greatest physical specimen in the world. Uh, he's closer to like Dan Vogelbach than, you know, than like, you know, one of the Hemsworth brothers. Um, but he, he really hits and he hits for power. He's got 24 homers already this year. He just got called up to double a, I think he, I don't think he's, you know, uh, like some type of star, but I think he at the very least will be a solid like platoon first baseman. That's like a strong side platoon guy. Um, that hits home for power and gets on base. He walks a ton. I think his walk rate's over 15% right now uh, across multiple levels. So, yeah, I think he's someone that's flying under the radar because he's a first baseman and he's not like you're, you know, he's a little bit older and he's a little bit uh, on the uh, heftier side, I will say. But he's a legit prospect. So that would be my second one. So, Austin, Brian, you – I think one of the, one of the guys that I have on my list, you guys have never heard of, and the other guy you guys probably love. So the first one I'm talking about is Jake Fox of the Guardians, third round pick last year. I got to see him a little bit in uh, a- ACL last year, and he just impressed me so much. He has bat speed. He has a he has um he's a solid runner. He's gonna be a, he has a plus in my opinion a plus hit tool, top of the order bat. I mean he'll get on base, he'll do stuff, he'll make stuff happen. And I was just watching last year. I was just so enthralled with how good of a hitter he was and how swiftly of a shortstop he he is. And the Guardians are loaded at shortstop. So that'll be interesting to see what they do with him. And my second is actually ACL from this year. And his name is Roseman Verdugo. He's with the Padres. And no one is talking about him. Hmm. He is 17 years old. And he's holding his own and did not play a single game in the DSO. He has seven bombs this year. And the, I think the leader of the ACL has 10. So there, there's something there with Roseman Verdugo. I think one of my first videos I put on my Twitter about the ACL was Roseman Verdugo making an, an absolutely amazing play at short, throwing out Jace uh, Jung, which was very interesting to me. And then I've just like, I've been watching him. He makes all the routine plays. I think he's a solid fielder. He'll have a good hit tool. It's just very raw, and he's facing competition that's two years older than him, but he's holding his own. So I think someone needs to start talking about Roseman Verdugo a lot more, uh, other than me, obviously. But you were yeah. definitely right. I have not heard of him. That is that's interesting. Seventeen year old showing that kind of power as a shortstop. Yeah. Who? Yeah. 
that's a good good sleeper. I'll have to I'll have to look into that one. Also, I agree with you 100 percent on Jake Fox, and he's such another one of these Indians type like hitterish guys that plays up the middle that you know just becomes a MLB piece somehow, and that's what they do. So I would not be surprised if he's the next one. Brian, Brian, it is the Guardians. Remember. <laughs> Oh, I, I I said guardians. I swear. Uh, yes, the guardians. guardians. I I swear. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. The, the oh man, that's not good. And now you ever like you ever hear like the older people and they're like, oh, the California Angels. Like that's me right now. I I I feel like such an old person. I'm gonna be calling them that, and I'm gonna be getting bad looks and stuff. For the rest of my life. Oh God! We, no, it's fine. Just... We're chill here at Prospect. <laughs> so you're good. You okay, should just cool. call them the spiders. Just be like, well, that's what they should have changed to. Oh yeah, yeah, that would have been better to be honest. It would be. I definitely would say that more often than Guardians. Guardians, not not the best, in my opinion. But I agree. But <laughs> anyway, here's the part where we, as individuals, lose followers rather quickly. Oh, JK, lol. But <laughs> here is our overrated segment. Brian, this is where uh, Austin uh, has said that Anthony Volpe is overrated. We've had someone say Jason Dominguez. I've even said that um, Eric Pena of the Royals is overrated. So you, this is where you can talk about anyone that you want that is overrated in your opinion. Let's hear it from you. I, I want to hear it from you first. Oh, then we'll go to Austin. I- I mean, this, the potential to be so wrong here is is intense, but I think Bobby Miller is overrated. Um, I, I get it. He throws a hundred. He has filthy stuff. I think he's a reliever. I think he's going to be a very good reliever, but I think he's a reliever, and I don't I, I don't see a lot of changes in terms of like his command and and. Um, his, his pitch mix in the sense that like he's going to suddenly be a starter. I mean, he's always had the filthy stuff, even dating back to, you know, Louisville and the results kind of never were there. And that's kind of what we're seeing now with Bobby Miller this year, where his ERA is over four. And like, this is kind of like, I don't know. It just seems like this is the same old Bobby Miller to me who I thought would be a reliever. And that, that's just, that's my feelings on him. No, okay, just... that that's hilarious because because Austin and I have had this argument pretty much every single day. When we were doing the Dodgers list, I kept saying I want Pepio above Bobby Miller. And mm. I kept saying it and I kept saying it and Austin loves Bobby Miller. He's like one of his favorite pitching prospects. I, I, I and every single Miller. day, the one thing I tell him is I'm like Bobby Miller is a reliever and he said no he's not. So I mean, Austin, you want to you want to try him in there? Yeah, I I personally like his upside more as a starter. I can see the concern and everything, but from the stuff, you know, I don't really have an issue with his mechanics overall. I think that, you know, it, now you're, damn it, now I'm just sad. <laughs> I'm just sad because you just gave Drake a lot more food and fire <laughs> for this argument. <laughs> so, um, no, I, I, I really I really just like his stuff. I like to be the, fair, you know, to be fair. I'm just saying that like I I was lower on him before he was drafted and his stuff has gotten much better since being drafted. So like already I'm wrong, <laughs> but I still so maybe it's just me hanging on to like me being out on him back then. That's like making me feel this way now. But I just I don't know. Just the same concerns that I had before are like here. So I would put them again like he could put it all together and make me look like an idiot. Like his stuff is so good that it's like best, one of the best pitchers in baseball type, you know? Yeah. I guarantee deal, you so. when this podcast ends though, that Drake is going to DM me on Twitter and be like, ha ha, someone else agrees with me that he's a reliever. <laughs> and um, cause you know, I, I like his projectability mm-hmm. as a starter. I think that his uh, mechanics are deceptive and, you know, I think that, any pitcher really at the end of the day, something could go wrong and they could end up in the bullpen. But I think Miller has more of a shot at sticking in the rotation for the Dodgers and anywhere else really. And so I think that with the velo, the stuff and his mechanics that I think it's going to work out for him. But that's just, that's just me now, apparently. 
Well, thank goodness scouting is subjective. Am I right, fellas? <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right, so uh, Austin, we're gonna we're gonna move on to you. Who's your uh, overrated? Okay, so I, I think that can I do two again? Sure, if you want to. All right. Well, I think for my first one, this one is honestly kind of tough because I've gone through a number of players that I think are overrated, and there are some like the draft guys who. I feel that way, but I think one of the guys I'm going to go with is Brennan Davis. I think that he he really had a lot of potential, but now he's like back in the ACL and struggling, you know, with the rehab assignment and everything. I still think that he does have potential, but I think that he's not going to end up the player that a lot of people were expecting originally. So for that, I think he's overrated. And Brian, you might hate me on this one because this one is also going to piss some people off because... I really do like this player overall, but I think if we're looking at like what where Pipeline has him, you know, if we're looking at where Pipeline has him, I think that Drew Jones right now is very like he's very high on on their list. And with his shoulder injury already happening and the fact that I I myself have uh, questions about his bat, I don't think his bat is going to be as good as what people think. I think that he will provide some power and amazing defense and he's still going to be a really good player. But I don't think that he's going to be like the next, you know, second coming of, you know, the next great outfielder. I think he's going to be a very good player. But for him to already be in, in like top 15 for pipeline, I think is just nuts right now, especially with the shoulders stuff presently. I mean, Austin, you kind of have to figure one thing, though. The, yes, there's a lot of hype around him, but you got to realize how many prospects have graduated this year from that list. Yeah. <laughs> like it's been a ridiculous amount of people. So it's like, I know, uh, like what we have at least Rushman, Julio, Gorman. I think Libertor is going to be probably by the end of the year. So like they, they got to like, you know, Ellie green. Yeah. yeah green. Green. Neil Cruz. Like it's Neil a Cruz, ton of guys. Yeah. So it's they, not that I like, don't think him that... being in that spot. No, go ahead. It, it's not that I don't think that he'll end up a top 15 prospect, but I think for him to already be at that spot, like I would rather have Noah Lee Marte. I would rather have Brett Beatty above him and Henry Davis. Like just looking at this list now, you know, there are a number of prospects that I would have above Drew Jones presently. Now that again, scouting is subjective. And I do think that Jones will end up probably a top 15 prospect when it's all said and done just right now at this moment. I think that he, you know, and again I think that it is too soon to call and too soon to have them this you know this high up on their list so yeah I'll I'll leave it at there yeah interesting Austin Brian do you uh you want to say anything about that no I don't know I, I I think I know he didn't go first overall but Drew Jones was you know for me and Pretty much our whole team was it was universal that like Drew Jones was on a tier of his own uh in this class. So like you said, uh Drake, like so many guys have graduated that it's like the the, the list is like kind of like reset in a way. So a lot of those new draft guys are gonna be on here. You know, I think if Henry Davis was in this class, I think Drew Jones would get paid more than Henry Davis personally. Um, I think that's just that's just my opinion. But yeah, I, I, I really like Drew Jones. Like I was I was not totally in on Drew Jones, and then I saw some video online of him, like some open side stuff, and I'm just like, oh my god, this guy's gonna be a monster. Uh, plus the defense and everything and the makeup is off the charts. It's it sucks that he's hurt, but you know, I I I'm I'm okay having him in the top like 15 or 20 or whatever personally. Yeah, I really hope the D-backs don't ruin him like they do a lot of prospects. But that is for a different discussion yeah. for a different day. All right, so Austin, you said you had another one. No, those were that... those were my two: uh, Brennan Davis and Drew Jones. Oh, Brennan Davis. Or Brennan I Davis. Sleep. I need sleep. Brian, do you have another one you want to go over? Are you? Okay? I actually had a second one. All right, let's hear, in let's case, hear. So. 
I mean, he's not like a top 100 guy or anything, but JT Ginn, I think, is just not very good. He, I saw him late last spring. And I was just like, this is not. Or, like, well, actually, no, when was it? It was late in the summer last year, like August or something. I was like, this is not the guy that I saw, like, you know, coming out of high school and briefly at Mississippi State. And I kind of wasn't surprised that the Mets wanted to move him and they traded him. I forget, who, who what was that trade? Was that for Bassett? I don't remember. It was for someone on that. Yeah, that it, they was traded him for. it was for Bassett. Yeah. yeah, like I'm not surprised. And considering how like the Mets like pitching depth in the minors is pretty bad, that they were safe, they were fine giving away JT mm-hmm. Ginn as a centerpiece to that. I, I I just have not seen it from him. Like like he the the stuff he saw early uh in his career. And sure enough, like this year he has not he has not really been that great. And I think he got a lot of hype for things that he did previously and um he really needs to turn it on because uh it's he's looking like like a reliever right now. Or a very, very back end starter. <laughs> wow. We are yeah. just picking on we're we're just picking on Austin today. I mean <laughs> Austin has told me how much he loves JT Ginn. Yeah. I, I did like him. here's the thing. I did like JT Ginn. I did, but and it just I don't know, since coming back from that Tommy John, I I just it just doesn't look like the same guy. He seems very like everything is just like very like vanilla. Is the word I would use. Like nothing stands out. Well, maybe he throws a lot of strikes. I'll give him that. He throws a lot of strikes. (laughs) Maybe I should just stop scouting pitchers because apparently I don't know what I'm talking about. So, (laughs) 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 all right, all right. So, I'm gonna go with. uh, So my two overrated. Um, I'm gonna start with my first one. I. We already kind of picked on the Dodgers a little bit, but I want to pick more. Woman Diaz is very overrated. I've seen him four times or four games at least at the ACL. He has not impressed me whatsoever. He's swinging at stuff in the dirt. He's taking pitches down the middle. He's barreled, I think, two balls in about 10, I think like nine, 10 at bats. And his only hit that I've seen is a ball off the end of the bat that in the major leagues would be caught by a second baseman. There's a little floater over the second baseman's head. And he just has not really been that like guy. Like I remember Austin was telling me that Wilman Diaz is just gonna be this guy and this amazing player. And I come out here and I hear that Wilman Diaz is, is just like this guy I need to I need to see. And I did he just has not been impressive and his numbers really are showing it too. Like he's the potential is there, but I feel like he's incredibly raw and it's just not translating as well as I think people were hoping and my second one no one has ever heard of this guy unless you're a White Sox fan and even then I guarantee you no one's ever heard of him but I'm saying this before everyone gets on him about being a top prospect I'm just putting this out here his name is Dario Barrero he is with the ACL White Sox and somehow this year, he is hitting 302, 339, slugging 352 with a 691 OPS. I don't know how he, he's doing that. Every time <laughs> I've seen him, he he's flailing at pitches in the dirt. He's uh, just like woman, well, maybe not like woman Diaz, but this guy's swing has been terrible every time I've seen him. Like literally flailing. It, it, he, there are some times where I'm even surprised that I don't think that he could hit water if he fell out of a boat type of deal. Like, <laughs> like it is like that when I see him, like I have not seen him barrel up one ball. I think the best at bat I've seen from him was a walk, but like when he swings the bat, it's just so ugly and it's just ground ball city for me. And just for the, for our listeners, you're going to see his video from ACL and you're probably going to click off it in the first 30 seconds and say, this guy does not have any potential. So before people start getting on him and saying they people need to buy him or whatever, like his, his baseball card or stuff, I'm just going to tell you all right now, Dario Barrero is not going to be good, and I'm pretty confident with that. 
and I know he's only 18, but his swing is just, oh my God, it is terrible. What position does he play? He is an outfielder. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. Like center field outfielder or like corner? Yeah. I mean, I've also seen, he's also played a little first. So, oh. Like the first time I saw him, he played first or DH. It was one of those two, but I've kind of forgot. There was a while back, but yeah, he's, oh, so this man. is like a, this is like a preemptive, like don't get too yeah. excited type deal. Okay. Yes, I, I right. do not. Th- I think he'll make it past. I think he'll be a 4A player if that, if he even gets out of double A. I will say wow. that right now. Wow. So. And how about the, the, uh, what's, oh my God, uh, Wilman Diaz. Um, how is his defense? Because I know he was supposed to be like pretty good short. His, his defense has been good from what I've seen, mm-hmm. but it's just, yeah. just bad from. Like, like from what I've heard from like Austin and people, like his bat has just been disappointing. Mm-hmm. Just oh my goodness, okay. just yeah. But he, he, they're both like I said, both these two could just completely shut me up. And yeah, but mm-hmm. just saying, people, if you see Dario Barrero on any top prospect list, just go ahead and click, click out because <laughs> yeah. But yeah, okay, good ones. Eh, I try. <laughs> Austin, anything? Yeah, thanks for making me seem like I know nothing. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, to be fair, you didn't really see them live, but no, it's okay, dude. You were right on couch there somewhat. Oh my god, what did you just say? Hey? What? What? All right, so we're going to move on from that overrated segment. But so now we're going to go to my favorite topic to do, is the, and that's stat of the day. And this, uh, obviously, you guys know the, the, the thing that I say, you know, I love going to fan graphs. But this one is the lowest FIP across all of minor league baseball with a minimum of 100 in each pitch. And for the people that don't know, FIP is pretty much just – taking the stuff that the pitcher can control and putting that it's basically like ERA, except it's only the stuff that a pitcher can control. So basically a batted ball is completely out of the equation here. Number one on this list is actually a pretty much of a shocker to me. Uh, Gavin Stone with the Dodgers at 2.43. Then we have Luis Devers with the Cubs at 2.98. We have Will Dion at 3.15 3.15 for uh, the Guardians. Tanner Beebe, shout out to uh, Caden Schmidt. He actually is a huge fan of Tanner Beebe. But uh, again, another Cleveland Guardian at 3.15. We got Robert Gasser with Milwaukee at 3.17. Dylan Dodd and Kyle uh, Muller out of the Brave system at 3.20 and 3.41. I'm going to mess up this name, but I'm going to say it as best as I can. Nohan Pani- Paniagua out of the Cardinal system at 3.43. Bryce Miller out of uh, Seattle system at 3.48. And Will Warren out of the Yankee system at 3.54. Gentlemen, anybody on that list that you want to talk about? Oh, I'll, I'll go first, I guess. I, I don't have... Well, I think Gavin Stone is one of the most underrated pitching prospects in baseball. And this kind of uh, just confirms it a little bit more. Um, but maybe I should have put him in the underrated prospect section. I don't know. Um, but I guess the thing that stands out to me is how many of these guys were drafted in last year or um, the year before. So like Stone, Dion, BB, Gasser, Dodd, Miller, and Warren were all drafted like really recently, um, which is really cool to see, um, especially when a lot of us didn't, you know, a lot of uh, draft people didn't expect a lot of pitching to come out of the, those classes. It's actually been... Uh, been pretty awesome to uh to see like all these guys and even guys who weren't like top of you know top of the class type guys first round types a lot of these guys are you know after the first or second round so just really cool uh also i think will warren is really good i like him a lot so i'm cool to see him on there yeah that's very interesting uh austin i think i know who you want to try to cover i think it's me bryce miller right yeah, he's, he's the one guy on this list that I'm really going to get into because for him to be on this list is pretty astonishing. I actually, yeah, you know, I, I live about um, 
15 minutes or so from uh, Texas A&M's campus. So I, I got to see a lot of Bryce Miller during his time there. And also when I wasn't at games, I got to see him on ESPN and everything. And I, I really liked his stuff and I, I thought that there was potential that he would make it, but I, I thought more of a, a reliever. So for him to be, for the Mariners to use him as a starter and him be this efficient and have this good of a season is a bit shocking for me to see. I'm really happy that, you know, for success, but yeah, I, I had him more as a reliever and he, he really did struggle with command overall. I felt, and uh, you know, so kudos to the Mariners for working on him with that. Sorry. I will end it there because apparently my brain is not working right now. <laughs> I blame Drake. <laughs> that is every day, Austin. That is every single day. Yeah, every day that I've known but you. But anyway. Yeah, I'm sorry that I'm the reason why your brain doesn't work. But anyway, I'm going to talk about number five on this list, number eight. I'm going to talk about Robert Gasser, who is actually just traded for Josh Hader. People need to get on, on his train. He's he's a darn good pitcher, and I think that he's in a – I don't know how he'd fare in Milwaukee, per se, because – of the whole, you know, the, how it's a ma- massive hitters park and stuff like that. But I did say the same about Eric Lauer, and Eric Lauer has been doing pretty well. But Gasser, he's he's underrated, and he's probably one of my favorite pitching prospects. And the the name that I butchered the most, and I'm so sorry if you ever listen to it, but to this uh, podcast, uh, Paniagua. But he is a guy that no one talks about in the Cardinal system. He's 22 years old. And he just has this this curveball that's incredible. He can locate it anywhere. He's a nasty sinker, gets a lot of ground balls. And he he, moment, he pretty much averages a strikeout and in inning. So he's a pretty good prospect to have in the Cardinal system that nobody ever talks about. So I'm pretty intrigued that he's on this list. I actually never heard of him. I'll be, I'll be completely honest with you. I, I, uh, I, that's, I a, that's a, a cool lot. one. A lot of our writers have not, so or not writers, but listeners have not. I guarantee it. But yeah, that was interesting, Brian, about Gavin Stone, though, because I would not think that he'd be on this list whatsoever. Because yeah, he's been I, amazing. I, I I know he's been amazing, but it's like <laughs> you 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 just don't think of Gavin Stone on a list where it's like talking about FIP or like ERA yeah. or like, like like you would think that he's like one of those guys that like is completely under the radar. Which this is, I mean, this isn't completely, but. Like, like Gavin Stone is the type of guy that you don't know who he is till he makes his major league debut and right. then goes seven in, seven no hit innings and strikes out ten, and then you're like, oh my god, who is this guy? Yeah, I I agree a hundred percent with that. He was a fifth round pick in a five round draft. Like he like he's really came out of nowhere. Like I'm, like the Dodgers are insane. <laughs> yeah, they're the best annoying. team in baseball. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's top to bottom. <laughs> yeah, it's very annoying. <laughs> hey i mean i mean can we talk about one guy though in the giant system mm-hmm. kyle harrison that's 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 one guy that yeah that that's a clear win for the giants on that one that whole oh, that whole 2020 draft for the giants pretty good even though patrick bailey's been kind of <laughs> but uh the rest of it i mean especially kyle harrison looks like an like a legit ace right now so we'll see it's very okay, encouraging you, you won back austin's heart because he hates patrick bailey <laughs> Yeah. I don't hate Patrick Bailey. I think there's still some hope, but I, it's you can't can't obviously you can't ignore that he's hasn't been very good for most of his time as a pro. Both Renzi and I do not. And apparently like he's, really. a, oh yeah, Ren, he's also lazy apparently, which we've heard. And he's just not a lot of good work ethic, which you, you you just can't do as a catcher. Like when when I saw him at AFL, I was expecting at least his glove. To be real, I mean, his glove was all right at the AFL, but I was expecting like his bat to at least keep up and just, I don't know. It, it seemed like, I guess you could see the potential there, but it, at the same time, it's like he, the, the impression I got was like, if he makes it, he's not going to make any impact with the bat at all. And, you know, catchers don't really have to, but a lot of people liked his bat coming out of the draft and everything. And so I was expecting to at least see something there. And I was just like, no, like th- this is just horrible. And now he's, and then I saw him, uh, I've seen a couple of Eugene games on MILB TV and just his swing is awful. Like, it's like, he's not even trying, honestly. 
Yeah, a lot of times it like he I also think he just sells out for hitting the ball in the air to pull. <laughs> I think that's like really all he tries to do sometimes. And that's why like his batting average is like complete garbage cuz he's just hitting, hitting weak pop-ups all the time. It's just like you, know, you got to have a little bit more of an approach than that, buddy. Yeah, that is that is one thing but, that I noticed yeah, I don't know. during the games that Eugene was like he was just hitting a lot of pop ups, and it's like, dude, like, what the hell yeah. are you doing? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. He's he's a very strange guy. He's not a good athlete, and he doesn't. I don't know. The work ethic thing is a problem for me because I think if he could stay a catcher, he would be fine, but. I, now I'm thinking he might just be a first baseman, which is like or at DH. that point you're just done. Because he, he, yeah, at that point you're just he's just not even really a prospect anymore because he doesn't hit enough. Yeah, and and yeah, like his his glove wasn't yeah. horrid at the AFL. It, it just it wasn't impressive either. And I was at least hoping that you know he would be decent behind the plate. And it's just like this is like the most bland person that I'm watching. Well, actually, that would be um. <laughs> Pedro Leon that I saw was like the most bland person. So I guess Bailey would be like the second most. <laughs> <laughs> I always, I, I don't know if you remember, there's a guy in, from this class, Hayden Dunhurst from Mississippi. He just got drafted by the Royals, I think. Oh, like, I got it. I got his uh, first uh, hit in uh, Pro Bowl. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah there's, like there's a devil right from the wall. His offensive profile reminds me a lot of Patrick Bailey. But Hayden Dunhurst is like an excellent catcher, and Patrick Bailey doesn't seem to care about that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't know. Just right. two guys I kind of feel are somewhat similar. All right, so we just went over the stat of the day. Now we're going on. Uh, this is called one one v one. We've we've kind of done this already with um, Austin. You're a terrible take when you had Kyle Har- with Kyle Harrison and Daniel Espino, and you said Daniel Espino over Kyle Harrison. But I forgive you because this one you can actually resurrect yourself here with Yuri Perez versus Grayson Rodriguez. Austin, I'll let you take over first. Well, I'm definitely going to go with Yuri Perez on this one. As much as I love Grayson Rodriguez, Yuri is just amazing. I remember when we first started putting together our risers and shiners lists and we were discussing Yuri Perez and I, I liked what I, the, the clips and everything that I saw of him on Twitter. But when I actually went and watched his games, like this man is just absolutely filthy. He's six foot eight, like 19 years old. He is hurt right now. So that that's a down downside. He was hurt the last time I checked, but it wasn't as bad as uh, Grayson's injury, but like upper nineties, just a hammer curveball. I, I think he's got three above average or better pitches and he's got above average control. In my opinion, I think that he has the future makings of a front end rotation pitcher. So, you know, Grayson is, is going to be the Orioles future ace, but I think that it's close, but I, I got to go with Yuri. Just, I, I love Yuri a little bit more. Well, I come to think, uh, Yuri is, uh, is also three years younger, so or two years, no, yeah, three. In in high A at nineteen, also, so that's pretty impressive. Actually, he's up to double A. Oh, he's in double A now. According to his MILB profile. All right. Well, good job, Yuri. You beast mode. All right. I I think that we could guess who Brian's going to go with, but uh, Brian, let's hear yours. You know, I I don't feel strongly about either one of them, but because I'm being forced to choose, <sighs> oh man, even like I even like hype myself up for this, and I can't. That's even hard to to even just say it out loud. I guess it would be I gotta go Grayson Rodriguez. I just I know Yuri Perez is younger. He's got you know, like just like he's so advanced for his age. But he's – and he is in double A. But I just feel like Grayson Rodriguez has shown such incredible stuff the moment he's been in pro ball. He's never really struggled. He's had success at triple A. Apparently, the Orioles are going to be competing, so he's going to be in the majors as soon as, you know, as soon as he's ready. I, 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 just, I just feel like there's a little bit more certainty, even with the injury. 
I feel like there's just a little more certainty of Grayson Rodriguez being that upper echelon pitcher, like a top of the rotation guy than Perez, who I see. I, I don't know how absolutely dominant he's going to be as opposed to like, just like a, I, like, how do I explain it? Yuri Perez, like, I feel like he's going to throw a ton of strikes. I don't know how, if his fastball is going to be like some bat missing, like, monster like Grayson Rodriguez is and that like concerns me a little bit he gives up like Yuri Perez does give up like a lot of fly balls so I could see possibly some home run problems in the future or or at least home run issues that like you know prevent him from being like a true ace um, whereas Rodriguez I just think this is like this is he's just such a deep repertoire of pitches and he has a command and he has a success and he's going to be in the majors really soon. So that that's who that he would be my choice personally. But it was close. I will say it was very close. Yeah, that's very interesting. Well, I mean, you really can't go wrong with either. I mean, both right. are, are stud young pitchers with pretty good strikeout numbers. But the thing with me is with both these guys, I mean, think about the pitchers around them. Like how much pressure will they actually have to uh, – can they take off themselves? Like, you know, Yuri Perez has Edward Cabrera. And you have Sandy Alcantara, where Grayson has D.L. Hall. He has – he's going to probably have Drew Rom at some point in that rotation with him. So it's really close. I, I, I just got to go Yuri just because I think – just the advancement that you were talking about, Brian, that's that's pretty amazing for a 19-year-old. Yeah. That's insane. And mm-hmm. the fact that he's already in double A, like at 19, that's – now, I do think that it's going to take a little longer for Perez to, like, I think he'll be in the majors by 21, especially if, like, this injury is, like, does stuff to him. Because sometimes with a pitcher, even a minor injury can really mess up a pitcher, which it sucks, but it's reality. Like, I don't know. I don't, it's just, it, this was a really hard one again. Yeah, it was. <laughs> you thought I did to myself, and I got to stop doing it. You forgot to mention that Perez will. Go ahead, Austin. Uh, you forgot to mention that Perez will have Max Mayer when when he comes back from an injury as well. That's true as well, Max Mayer as well. So, but let's just talk about this. the Marlins' future rotations. Um, insane to say yeah. the least. Absolutely. But, yeah, that's it, that was a hard one. I shouldn't have made these so hard, but no. <laughs> No, it's good. It's, yeah. it's, it's, I think it's better that I think it's a good idea that you had to do this. I mean, I just, I guess with Yuri Perez, I don't know. I'm, I guess I'm so jaded with like past pitchers where it's like, I'd rather have the guy who's like right on the cusp of the majors because there's, there's just less unknown from of like what can happen. Just so much random nonsense and unfortunate things happen to pitchers where it's like, I want less of that, not more. So basically, so, just risk. So basically, it's yeah, just... there, there is like a, a, like even though Yuri Perez is like incredibly, it's probably one of the safest pitching prospects in baseball. But you know, if I'm choosing him or Grayson Rodriguez, uh, I'm gonna take Grayson Rodriguez, even with you know his injury stuff, which doesn't seem to be super long term or anything. But yeah, I don't know. I just, I just want the guy who's closest to give me an impact as soon as possible. Yeah, that's and that's me. a lot of people would want that, especially in the scouting world. Yep. Mm-hmm. So yeah, go ahead, Austin. No, I was I was just agreeing. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought you were saying say something, but anyway, we're gonna move on and be a little bit more open to the the listeners on how we operate things when we go and actually look and scout out a player. So my one question for you guys is. What's your scouting process when you go and see a player? Like, if it's, um, I don't know, say, so say you go to a high school game and you're watching a high school kid, and, or you go to a college, you're watching a college kid. But what do you guys think? What, what do you guys' is, uh, scouting processes? Uh, I guess I'll go first. <laughs> Uh, for me, I'm always look like in if it's like an in-person scouting thing. The thing that I'm trying to focus on is like, bo- like player bodies, like how they're, you know, how they, um, you know, 
just just their, their overall physicality, their overall twitchiness, athleticism, uh, just and just like how their body is made up, like their shoulders, their you know where their their waist is, stuff like that. I feel like that stuff is I much better, you know, getting a sense of where a player is in person for that kind of stuff, as opposed to, like a lot of like mechanical things. I don't always pick up on and I have to rely on like the video I'm shooting to look back on and, you know, look back on notes and stuff. But for me, I'm focused more on like the physical stuff personally. Uh, I'm also now more than ever. I was totally in the past. I was totally a guy like, Oh, you know, like makeup doesn't matter. Like, you know, tangibles, what is that? Like who cares? Like now I'm focused on that so much. Like, I'm look. I'm I'm watching the player in the dugout. I'm watching them talk with their fielders. I'm watching every every ball that's put in play, what they're doing. So I want to I want to know like what you know what that player's like and what their attitudes like and their effort level and stuff. So that kind of stuff I feel is really easy to pick up on in person. So that's what I focus on most. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I, I love uh, talk about makeup uh, because I'm a high school baseball coach and, and I see kids that just walk in there be like yeah I pretty much own this place like they make it look like mm-hmm. they they're like you know the, the crap and like and then baseball humbles them really quick and but then they still have this attitude like I don't really care and that's just that's when like scouts just you know what we like we see them but they take them off their list because of that makeup the problems For with sure. makeup yeah, there was a guy. There was a guy I saw this spring, a high school player who he was crushing the. I saw him two or three times, three times crushing the ball, but there was multiple plays where he just didn't hustle. He didn't run, and it was so. It was just blatant. And I was just like, nope. <laughs> like, like I'm not. I'm not gonna bother writing this guy up. Like if you can't run out the ball in high school, like what? What are you doing here? You know. So. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That's true. That's how I feel too. And you know, yeah, what to, to do you? Or one more thing about that point. Uh, I, I was at a high school game this spring, and there's a guy who at the time was committed to Baylor. He's now uh, committed to Tennessee, and he cr- absolutely crushed the ball to dead center. It was maybe a foot short of being a home run, and the center fielder robbed him of at least a triple. And I mean, this guy was burning it. Like you could see that he was determined. So I really like that approach from, uh, you know, trying to scout as well. And when he got robbed, like he tipped his helmet to the center fielder, like out of respect, like, like you could tell like, oh crap, I just got robbed. But at the same time, it was such an amazing play that like, you know, you got to respect your competition as well. I feel, uh, and it's good to see players do that stuff like that. So that, that's another thing on like scouting for like how they handle, uh, or, what y'all were getting at just now sorry but i think the the main way that i scout is when i'm looking at hitters i'm more trying to see their approach like if they're making good reads of the the pitches like you know if they they're not just going to swing at everything trying to pull the ball and also how well they can hustle out of the box and you know run the bases and not necessarily like more going opposite field i i I just don't want to see a player trying to pull like but yeah you know when i was saying like uh about a player pulling a ball of the ball i don't want to see him try and do that every pitch so if he can at least focus on putting the ball in play and hitting it the other way like that's that's kind of what i look forward to and i know that's extremely hard to come by but i've seen it happen so i i don't get super high on a player if they're just pulling the ball all the time and yeah just how how hard they hustle around the base pass you know whether whether they can keep up on the field, you know, those are the main ways that I, I look at players and I know it's super basic, but that that's what I've gotten used to. That's, that's cool. I, I just want to throw in another guy, like just who seem to be talking about like the hustle and tangibles and stuff. One guy I saw, he's a catcher from my area. His name was Adonis Guzman. He was uh, one, probably what the best defensive catcher in the class. Um, he's going to Boston College. He wasn't drafted, but he he was up like they were. He like was so like locked in on what he was doing. It was a double header, and for both games, he was like didn't sm- barely smiled. He was just locked in. A new pitcher came in. He walked up to like the first baseline out of the dugout 
and was watching them and like telling his teammates stuff. And then like behind the plate, he was, you know, he was, didn't take a pitch off his, it was just amazing to see. And like, like when you see that, like, the, I don't know, like you, you're not going to pick up on stuff like that when you're watching like a game on TV or something. So I, I try to pay attention to that stuff because it really does make a difference in like what their eventual outcome is. Yeah, that's, that's very, uh, that's very interesting though. Both your guys' points. I mean, it, it doesn't really take a lot just to have effort and, yeah. and, and a lot of the kids that like, you know, that think like Austin and talked about this all the time, but Brian, one of my favorites ha- movies has to be trouble with the curve because in the end, that the, the the second overall pick, as Austin was saying, he's hitting all the balls out to left field. Everything's pull. Everything's pull. And then it turns out he kind of sucks at hitting curve balls. So, like, but he was so like just cocky, arrogant, and it it he got humbled really quick by a lefty who has a damn good curveball. But yeah, so I think my just to finish this up, I think that. My scouting process is the first thing I'm looking at with hitters is I look at the pitches that they're swinging at first before I do anything, because if they're just up there, just whiffing at stuff in the dirt, much like I was saying with Dario Barrero, like what pitches is he swinging at? Is he taking pitches just barely all off the edge? Like Austin, I actually got Austin to be a fan of one of my favorite prospects who's Milkar Perez. He's not doing that good this year, but he still has a high on base and he walks a lot. And I love guys that are high on base. Pitching wise, I would just look at location. I would look at how much movement, even though I, I'm i not the biggest advocate for velocity, even though a fastball 95 with movement is just absolutely insane. Like I would rather have a pitcher that has movement and control on any pitching staff of mine. So like, I would just dip into that. And just in general, like when I'm at a game, I just want to just look at as many players as I can, which that's where I, I use my video. Like I'll go home and like slow down the bat from open side and just see the point of contact and see what, like one of my favorites out here, his name is Logan Wagner with uh, Dodgers. Oh. And yeah, it, he he's shown a lot, but yeah, that's just, I think that we all pretty much have the same type of process when we're scouting. So that's really interesting. Yeah, for sure. I, I, Logan Wagner was somebody that one of our writers, uh, Will, um, he saw and was <laughs> when the Dodgers took him, he's like, yep, that's a good pick. <laughs> like he, another good pick for the Dodgers. Like, so that's funny that you brought him up. Yeah. It's, there's another guy in the Dodgers ACL that just, I'm not really high on. He's, his name's uh, Chris Newell. He's you know he was twenty. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's Virginia. Uh, yeah, he's uh not that good from what I've seen. He like he it and also like another thing I look at is like how do they respond to failure? Like I remember Austin and I were watching Zach Deloach one time and just every time he responded to failure, it just looked like he just gave up on himself. And it's like mm-hmm. I tell my players all the time, like you gotta be mentally able to compete and deal with failure to be a baseball player and a lot of players can't so that's why they quit after high school quit after college because failure just kills them so yeah but yeah very I'm, interesting all around but hold up i'm, I'm totally oh, cir- i'm totally circling back to what i was saying earlier the word that I, or the words that i was looking for when i was talking about the kid who tipped his helmet competitive sportsmanship that's that's also what I look, what i look for Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I haven't I haven't run into any like bad like competitive sportsmanship like sportsmanship type things. I haven't really seen much of that. Um but just some sometimes like effort level and things like that are just like uh like it's a red flag. I have a question for you, Drake. You said you don't is there like you said you don't care about velocity as much. Is there like a level for like let's say you're watching college is there like a level where like let's say his pitcher's only throwing 88 is like is that like at that point are you just like okay i'm not gonna really spend too much time on this guy or is it like or is there really not 
to me, it depends because scouting at the ACL, you see a ton of terrible pitching, like guys that throw, they top out at 91 and they can't throw strikes. Mm-hmm. So if if a dude's throwing 89, 88, 89 to or 88 to 90, like I'm okay with it if it's like movement and he's getting weak contact and stuff like that. But if he's not throwing strikes, I'm like, okay, yeah, bye. Like my my entire thing's just strike throwing, like first pitch strikes, stuff like that. Like even just like weak contact. But I do some it it depends like with the ACL, like I care about Velo, but like with my players, because I basically work at like a D, I, I think we're like, like, we're not, like, a big-time high school, so I don't really tell my players, oh, you got to throw 90 to 95 just to even, like – no, I'm just, like, just throw strikes and see what happens. So, it's, like – and I teach them, I'm, like, movement. Movement is something that I preach. And and if they gain velo, I'm, like, okay, heck, yeah. But other than that, I'm just more movement and control than anything. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. But – Anyway, Brian, this is the time of the show. We have a, since you've listened to us uh, quite a few times, you know what is about to happen here. Brian, we need to hear your top five favorite prospects. This is something that we always do with our new people on this show, but let's hear them. Okay. Do they have to be in order of my favorites? Like number one, no, two, no, three? No, no, no. You, okay. you could just do top okay. five. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll go... Corbin Carroll is one of them. I love Corbin Carroll. Harry Ford from the Mariners. Uh, Kyle Harrison, I have to choose because I'm a Giants fan, and he's he's uh, a lot of our hopes are riding on his arm. Kevin Alcantara for the the Cubs, I think, is just so such a unique and exciting prospect. I want to see what he does over the next several years. And then number five, I'm going to go with Owen White from the Rangers who I think is uh, a little bit underrated and uh, I think it's just a really good pitcher. And uh, he's going to be a nice piece for the Rangers. Those are like, uh, I don't know if those are my five favorite, but those are five of, of my favorite prospects in the minors currently. So, uh, I, so I as, as you were saying them, uh, Austin just, Austin just sent me a message saying Alcantara LFG with a bunch of uh, uh, exclamation points and all in caps. So I'm assuming you made him really happy. Yes. I, I'm a, <laughs> I, I just, he's just, yeah, uh, I, I've seen a lot of Myrtle Beach games this season, and he's definitely unique. Like, he, he's, I mean, he runs kind of funny. That That's really the only bad thing that you can say about him. Like, he, he kind of runs like he, like a duck, honestly. Um, but even then, he's he's got speed to his game. I think he at least has three tools. Like, I would, I, I would have his hit at 55, power plus, and defense. Uh, or I guess four tools, maybe. I need to get an accurate home to first on him but a defense honestly i think he can keep up in center as well like he's not gonna stay in center in chicago because of a uh, pca but i think he like i honestly could give him a rule six like an above average player overall i i think he to me he kind of reminds me of like a right-handed daryl strawberry a little bit and that might sound kind of crazy but that that's what i see from alcantara yeah he's just like the thing that i'm interested in is just to see how his like He's, he's so like there's so much physical development remaining on him like his frame is just not filled out at all yeah. i just want to see how his body fills out and like what that does to the rest of his tools in his game because i mean like he's just an enormous guy and like i think the way you you mentioned it like he kind of runs like a duck it's like like yeah it's like he's like not even like fully formed into his body yet like yeah so it's like he's just such a such a you and like he's very he is like a very raw prospect but he's also like he's he's not embarrassing himself this year he's like he's playing pretty well so i like just it just seems like the sky is the limit for him i'm just really excited to see like you know what he ends up being he's just like such a cool like almost like a case study yeah and like i i definitely okay so this is now called the this is now this is a this uh episode's gonna be called Runs Like a Duck. Okay. So <laughs> <that'll be perfect. laughs> but yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with you, Brian, that um I, I think Alcantara could gain like at least another 15 pounds. Like he's still pretty lanky. I think what I what really made me fall in love with Alcantara, or I think it's Alcantara's game, is he hits all over the field and he also hustles in center. Like but those two things combined it just 
there's so much projection with them. Like, I think I looked at his fan graphs numbers and I think he hits something only like, like 40% or pull and like everything else is up the middle or opposite field. And every game that I've seen him, he pretty much goes up the middle or opposite field and not just, he doesn't just do that. He hits the ball hard the other way too. So I think that that really adds to his swing and uh, mm-hmm. projectability with his bat. For sure. Sorry, I, I'm like he, he is a top five favorite for me now too. So I I could talk about him all day. <laughs> Austin, Austin, I actually so it's actually funny because I was the first one to tell Austin. I was like, dude, he runs like a freaking duck, and now Austin <laughs> just goes and he's like, dude, he he runs like a duck, and I'm like, dude, oh, God. <laughs> no, I, I'm actually working on an Alcantara scouting report right now, and I was showing Caden my work, and I was like. Yeah, uh, so this is what I have under his run uh, run box. I was like, he runs funny. And Kane was like, no, you need to just say he runs like a duck. Let's be real. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> Not wrong. Yeah, I don't know. We're, we're a weird bunch. It's okay. <laughs> I also, but... oh, you know what would be, not, not to steal any of your thunder or anything here, but a good, like, uh, like a versus or a, a start bench cut type of thing would be like Alcon- Alcantara. Is it really Alcantara? That, that's I what know. I keep hearing is Alcantara. Oh. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll go with that then. Alcantara. Alcantara versus Jason Dominguez, I think, is a really oh. good one. Oh <laughs> my God. You, hey, we could extend this. I just thought right of now a great then. idea, though. That's a, I mean, <laughs> I haven't seen a lot of Alcan- Alcantara, so I can't really. I, I mean, you two can have that. that discussion i can just put it in i don't mind i I, i'm just i the thing is like dominguez is like it's it's just they're like polar opposites where like dominguez is like fully like formed physically and then like alcantara is not or oh man yeah alcantara i'm gonna keep messing that up he's he's not there's like so much like so much physical projection that needs to be done with him so i don't know just like a cool like which one's better type thing I, i you know i don't have a i don't really have a I think I would probably take Alcantara personally. Uh, I think Dominguez is a little overrated, but at the same time, you know, I, I'm kind of I'm just more interested interested to sit back and see like how their careers progress. For, you know, let's be honest here. What Yankees prospect isn't overrated? That, that is very true. That's but, a good question. But the amazing thing too is both <laughs> are just 19 years old, so it's not like you know Alcantara right? is fill out tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Like he could he could just fill out his frame by like 21, and then he just you know, reaches double A and hits like maybe 30 bombs in double A. Just anything is possible with that kid. Yeah. I just thought of something amazing that I'm going to put in like our next podcast, Austin. Yeah. And it's going to be like, like kind of like not a trade retrospective, but like, who would you rather have? So like Rizzo or Alcantara and whoever the other guy was Alcantara. in that trade, I forgot. Like, who would you rather have like, I'll contra. Yeah, but who was the whoever the other guy was in that trade? And then we would we would discuss like, oh, would you rather have Rizzo or I would rather have contra. like for yeah. your future? Oh yeah, wow. I, I couldn't believe they traded him to be honest. Yeah. For Anthony Rizzo. I thought that was absurd. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, the Yankees are stupid idiots because Brian Cass is an <laughs> idiot, but yeah, there's so much of idiots that but, you and I turned away from him. <laughs> Yes, yeah, sir. But uh, yeah, Austin, you're you're you went from a good team to a bad team, which is kind of stupid. And, well, but you know, you got Corey Seager. I wasn't gonna root for the Astros. I needed a Texas team to root for, so I chose the Rangers. And I always liked the Rangers growing up, anyway. But I no way in hell I will root for the Astros. <laughs> Can't. Yeah, I know. Growing up, man, you saw 2011. That's what happened. I hate you so much. All right, well, we should probably end this now. Um, as always, guys, this was a pledge. This was a lot of fun. Brian, thank you for coming on our show. That was really fun. When we're, 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 We should have you again. Absolutely, so, man. This was great. Thank you. Awesome. So uh, anyway, as always, this has been Prospects Worldwide. We're still working on our risers and shiners list, getting them out. But yeah, as always, I'm your host, talented, amazing Drake Man. You can follow me on Twitter at DrakeMan4. Austin, say where they can find you and anything you want to plug or talk about. Yeah, I'm the uh, the less obnoxious and not as self-confident Austin Farmer. You can follow me on Twitter at AustinF0421. 
And uh, thanks for joining us, Brian. This was a lot of fun today. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Yeah, where, where can we find you again, Brian? So uh, I write at prospectslive.com. Um, kind of in a little bit of a dry area. There's not a whole lot of baseball up here in the Northeast at the amateur level. Um, but I will be going to uh, Fenway Park next month for uh, a future stars showcase. There's also going to be some fall ball starting up. So I'll have stuff, some posts up there. And uh, you can also follow me at Brian underscore Rekka for all my random baseball thoughts. Everyone go. Yeah. Follow him. Follow him. He's good. He's solid. But anyway, guys, that does it for prospects overload. Peace, everybody. Peace, everyone.